I call the meeting of the Environment, Natural Resources, Finance, and Policy Committee to order. A quorum is present. Representative Fisher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move the approval of the minutes from Tuesday, February 28th. Representative Fisher moves the minutes for February 28th, 2023. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. Motion prevails. The minutes are adopted. Members, we have a very full schedule today. Uh, we have an hour of extra time, but that doesn't mean we can dawdle. Uh, we have a lot to go through, and we'll be going through quite a bit. A number of these bills need to get referred to other committees, uh, so we will move promptly. First up is House File 1853, Representative Acom, University of Minnesota Extension Service Weather Resilience Program funding provided. We've allocated about 20 minutes for this. Representative Acom. I will move that House File 1853 be re-referred to the Climate and Policy and Energy Finance Committee. Representative Acom, I believe you have an A1 author's amendment. Yes. Could you briefly uh, describe the amendment? I will, I will move the A1 amendment. Representative Acom. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. And the A1 amendment is just um, putting in some <clears throat> excuse me, um, dollar figures and setting a, a timeline for um, the program. And so um, it's not very substantial as far as content. The A1 amendment has been moved to get the bill in the shape the author would like. Any questions? Any questions? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. <laughs> Ayes have it. Uh, the A1 amendment is adopted. Representative Acom to the bill as amended. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members. Um, I do want to start out by wishing Chair Hansen a happy birthday. Aww. Yeah, see, should we sing? No, we shouldn't sing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Singing will be out of order. Yeah, all right, all right, sorry. We won't go that far. Um, but thank you for the opportunity to present House File 1853 as amended. This bill establishes a weather ready extension program to build capacity with the existing structure of our established and trusted extension program that will assist land managers across the state to be more resilient in their land practices and to adapt to our changing climate. Extension services has a long tradition of taking science based solutions and working with counties, tribal governments and private landowners to build a better Minnesota, which is, which is exactly what we need to be doing at this moment in time when we are facing challenges caused by our changing climate. Additionally, a weather ready extension program would bring capacity throughout the state to access the many federal programs offered through the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, targeting resilient lands. So with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I have a couple of um, testifiers. If the testifier, uh, Dr. Heidi Roop, could come forward. Welcome, and if you could state your name for the record. My name is Dr. Heidi Roop. Um, Chair Hansen, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to join you this afternoon. Um, I'm an assistant professor of climate science um, and the state's extension specialist for climate change and adaptation at the University of Minnesota. As part of my role in extension, I have the great privilege of serving as the director of the University of Minnesota Climate Adaptation Partnership, Minnesota's leading multi-sectoral group leveraging university expertise and real-world practitioner perspectives to help prepare Minnesota's diverse communities for the impacts of a changing climate. Through this work, we get to advance critical climate science and knowledge about our state, but as our name implies, get to work in partnership with communities, commodity groups, and the public and private sector to support the use, integration, and education required to bring climate-related knowledge into decisions, all with the goal of improving the health and well-being of Minnesota residents, our waterways, and our natural and built environments. We know that Minnesota is getting warmer and ready, wetter and already grappling with the impacts and costly consequences of this warmth, as well as the challenges associated with coping with more frequent transitions between droughts and floods. And just as the science says is it is critically urgent to reduce emissions, science clearly shows it is also urgent that we work together to prepare our state and our communities and our economy for the impacts of climate change that we've quite frankly already committed to. 
from improved soil health, cover cropping, reforestation, to climate-ready storm and wastewater infrastructure, improved building standards and transportation systems, investments in public health and emergency and disaster response, climate-tolerant crops to climate-adapted adapted tree species, the list of adaptation actions or preparation investments and options is long. However, to date, programs and investments seeking to build weather and climate resilience preparedness tend to be fragmented, small in scale, sector specific, or designed primarily to respond to near-term risks. We are often also focused intentionally on planning more than implementation. And right now, with historic federal investments passed in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and the Inflation Reduction Act, Minnesota could be poised to benefit from a multitude of mitigation and adaptation investments. But surveys of Minnesota's local units of government show that the lack of capacity and technical expertise are substantial barriers to accessing competitive funds that would bring their community-identified priorities and projects into reality. These are barriers relatively small investments could help our state overcome, bringing significant rewards and offering substantial returns on investment. The Extension Weather Ready program seeks to address these very needs by adding critical capacity, providing essential localized data and planning tools, and offering technical assistance and education to help Minnesotans prepare for and respond to their changing climate risks. Extension is uniquely positioned to provide trusted, durable, and sustainable, and localized capacity, data and tools, and technical assistance to communities across the state. From urban to rural, city to township, Extension has a reach and impact in every county in our state. We have robust infrastructure that includes our campuses, regional offices, and educators providing programming throughout the state. Importantly, our teams live in and support the communities they serve. Extension staff are trusted resources and also serve as a critical conduit of information about their issues and needs and should be better centered in guiding university research. This two-way street between communities and the university leads to more responsive, responsible, and community-engaged research. However, our programming and capacity as it relates specifically to weather and climate preparedness is currently limited. We're making significant progress by leveraging donations and grants and other federal investments, but we're currently falling short of our, able, our ability to meet all the needs and requests that we're getting as a program coming from across communities in the, across the state. And fortunately, with the support of the legislature, my team is generating unparalleled future climate data for our state. But as we all very well know, data alone do not translate into use or preparedness. We need to be able to provide more support to communities and sectors when they call. We also need to have people in the places where solutions and information are needed. This is the power and opportunity of extension. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in a recent report outlined key investment priority areas with the potential to quote, significantly reduce climate related risks and enhance climate resilience. These include locally specific scientific information about projected climate risks. Thank you for that proactive investment. Education and capacity building with efforts focused on future climate risks and how to use and incorporate them in today's decisions. Improved coordination and collaboration to enable the integration of adaptation efforts across sectors, jurisdictions, geographic and geopolitical boundaries. This is where Extension excels and has a legacy of effectiveness and impact. And finally, adoption of climate of nature-based adaptation approaches with the effort, intention to enhance resilience of ecosystems and the built environment. Thanks to the work of members of this committee and others in the legislature, acceleration of such critical investments are already underway. This program is a needed and critical partner for engaging more Minnesotans in those investments and engaging other sectors in these efforts and providing the needed education and serving as a critical bridge between planning and action. Specifically, this program will add capacity and expertise by placing critical climate extension positions across the entire state. 
They would be distributed across the state with sectoral and place specific expertise associated with the needs and impacts and responses we need to deploy as communities in order to respond to our climate risks. And we see this program as a direct complement to the extension program called the Climate Energy Resource Teams, or CERTs, which is also supported by the state legislature. The Weather Ready Extension Program would work in direct complement to the energy efficiency and mitigation focused programming of CERTs, bringing a holistic approach to climate solutions to the state of Minnesota. We would bring research to practice by having dedicated extension staff who are able to assist in the interpretation and application of localized climate data and research. And importantly, we can work to accelerate the timeline between planning and implementation by offering timely and accessible support that will make it easier for our communities and sectors to apply for and increase the competitiveness of their applications for historic federal and state programs that are making substantial investments in climate smart practices from farms and forests to our roads and our riverways. We'll advance and improve understanding of Minnesota's climate risks. Importantly, also monitor effective responses by evaluating what climate re resilience strategies are actually working on the landscape. And finally, this is an opportunity to demonstrate national leadership by standing up a program unlike any other in the country in the extension service. As an expert in climate science and adaptation, I know very clearly that one size fits all solutions won't lead to the best outcomes for our states and our communities. However, right now there is a capacity gap to tailor responses and support communities in securing the resources and putting the plans in place to make their communities climate resilient. The investment in statewide capacity and expertise, leveraging existing infrastructure and investment the state and federal government already make, building on a legacy of trust and impact that extension can bring will help accelerate the state's goals and ambitious vision for a climate ready and resilient Minnesota. Thank you for this opportunity and for the hard work you're already putting underway to prepare our state for the future. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kate Knuth, Democracy and Climate. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, my name is Dr. Kate Knuth. I'm the Managing and Research Director at the 100% Campaign. The 100% Campaign is a cross-sector, statewide, multiracial, intersectional campaign to build equitable, clean climate and clean energy future in Minnesota. And we have nearly 60 organizational endorsers to date. Uh, I'm here to voice support for House File 1853, which would fund the University of Minnesota Weather Ready Extension Program. A couple of years ago at the 100% campaign, we released a white paper giving an overview and review of climate adaptation and resilience work across Minnesota. And it was clear then, and even more clear now, that Minnesota communities are already feeling the impacts of climate change. Whether it's farmers last summer who were dealing with droughts, or parents like myself in the summer of 2021 who had to decide if the wildfire smoke out in the was making the air quality bad enough that I had to keep my daughter indoors. Um, Minnesotans are feeling climate change already and it's going to only increase. We also saw in our review of climate adaptation and resilience in this state that communities are starting to do the work of preparing for and responding to climate impacts. They're planning and preparing for a future with bigger weather extremes and other climate change impacts like a longer allergy season. However, not every community has the resources to do this work yet. Because we, we know this because communities are already asking for help uh, with the Climate Adaptation Partnership. They want to better use weather projection data. They need the technical capacity and support to, to prepare their communities. And the thing is we shouldn't expect every single city, county, uh, watershed district, every community to develop the data and the expertise needed to plan and pre prepare for climate change well. It's not the best use of resources, nor is it the most equitable way to prepare our state because not every community has the, an equitable ability to develop these resources. And that's where the University of Minnesota Extension comes in. Extension, as you've heard, already has a statewide infrastructure connected deeply to the research expertise of the university and deeply connected to communities. Extension educators are trusted community partners and resources. 
So we now have the opportunity to add specific climate adaptation and resilience building capacity and staff to the strong foundation at extension with House File 1853. Doing so will better prepare Minnesotans and Minnesota communities for our climate future and we hope you'll support the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, any questions? Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Representative Acom, or to any of your testifiers. <laughs> so there's been, uh, of course, lots of presentations uh, over the last few months and over the last few years relative to climate. Um, we heard just in MPCA's overview and budget yesterday, we heard about what they're doing in, in terms of climate and preparedness. A lot of the same words, climate investment, solutions, so on and so forth. Um, what are we doing to ensure that we're not duplicating that effort that's happening over multiple uh, bills that have been proposed? We got De La Sard Sands, the LCCMR, and DNR, and MPCA, and of course, the U here today. Uh, do we know that we're using taxpayer dollars efficiently in this subject area? And I'll have one more question after that, Mr. Chair. Representative Acom. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Heinzman. And I think that's a really good question. And I, I think that um, while you bring up a lot of different agencies and um, the university, I think they, in some ways, um, swim in different lanes. And so I think that um, the extension service is deeply embedded within our communities in a way that MPCA is not. And so to be able to build that capacity in the already existing infrastructure of extension is in a completely different way. So maybe a farmer in um, rural Minnesota is likely going to reach out to extension looking for help in how they manage their land and change and how they manage the changing weather that they're seeing on their land. And so they're going to reach to extension um, more likely than they would be reaching out to MPCA. So I think they, they swim in different lanes. And Representative, Heinz, Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Chair. So I, I understand what you're saying, Representative. I, I, uh, I would suggest that there is a lot of overlap. Uh, I would like to see more collaboration in this subject area so we're not simply continuing to throw more, and I'm talking about hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars towards this issue. My next question, though, would be uh, how would you suggest, Representative, we measure whether or not we've had an impact in this subject area? Um, so, Representative Aikum. My apologies, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative um, Heinzman. I, I think two things I want to say. One is I would love for Dr. Roop to be able to come up and um, maybe show examples of how there is collaboration and coordination without duplication. Um, but to your question about showing success, I think that um, just as again, and I'm sure Dr. Roop can point to this as well, how they measure success through extension now. And, and I don't know necessarily what those matrix are, um, but I would imagine it has a lot to do with um, implementation um, with landowners, land managers, um, and whether it's looked at in acres that are impacted or I, I'm sure there are different um, matrix that are used. Would you Chair, mind to clarify? So, we, can, we can upload the materials. We have, we have to stay yeah. on time. We've got okay. eight bills today. Representative Heinzman. Final question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'll clarify to get more specific. So I think what the what Minnesotans are looking for is a measurable matrix. In other words, have we seen anything uh, in, in terms of what's happening in our environment around us that we can say that is a direct impact due to what we have uh, invested into this subject area. And that's hard to nail down. That's why I'm asking the question. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Acom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm going to um, ask Dr. Roop to um, respond to that because I think she's got a, a perfect response. So Dr. Roop. Please. And representative, thank you for that question. Not sure my response is perfect, but well. um, I, can, I can say that um, we are working in close coordination with the various agencies on their budget proposals. And within that, there is a request for technical assistance. However, exactly how that gets deployed is unclear. And it's not clear that that is going to come in a form that is actually something other than consultants. And we are all in support of partnering with trusted consultants. But to um, Dr. Canoe's point, um, we're really invested in equitable access to knowledge and resources and helping ensure communities are connecting in a timely, efficient, and cost-effective way 
to the resources of the state so um, and not duplicating effort and I think 65% of extension staff live in greater Minnesota I don't know the proportion of what state agency staff um, occupy the landscape outside of the metro but I think that is a defining characteristic um, and we were also I was just with state agency staff leading adaptation and resiliency efforts with PCA today at the Ag Urban Forum and we discussed this very need around what sort of assistance do you need and I'll give you a concrete example um, through the IRA funds and IIJ funds and I can't recall exactly which fund there's money moving from USDA to the Department of Natural Resources in the state of Minnesota because we have a forest we have a forest management plan for the state which enables us to unlock federal monies it's the best of my knowledge there are three people responsible for that program and moving this money on the landscape where extension can be really valuable is when we are on the land working with natural resource managers foresters tribal governments three staff can't work in coordination to be able to connect people and resource managers to those monies so we're a a bridge in this network because there isn't quite frankly enough capacity to meet the need and we're also not a regulatory body and so we come with different trust and there are of course so I think there are key differences and we are working in complement and in our indirect conversation I think to your point of metrics um, we are actually under contract right now with the state of Minnesota as an organization to help develop met resilience and adaptation metrics for the state of Minnesota acknowledging that we actually really have to do research to understand what we track what we monitor and how we qualify impact and as far as extension and how we do that um, there are clear examples and I'm happy to send you a recent report our um, we have ag economists and economists within extension actually just did a study to evaluate the return on investment from programs like our nutrient management programs and some of the investments that have been made in um, supporting an irrigation specialist extension educator that's been supported by the Department of Agriculture and we can very clearly quantify the return on investment from these positions so happy to share those resources but we are working actively to measure our programs, not just in terms of the number of people participating in programs, but how that's translating to improved outcomes and well-being for Minnesota and our natural environment. Any other questions? Representative Akam, my concern is kind of a different one. You know, and I've just heard that 65% of the extension specialists are in greater Minnesota. So the whole tone has been that the money goes out and I want to make sure that there are poor communities, poor census mm -hmm. tracts that may not have access to extension, and they get left out because the idea is to take get it out. So I want to hear from you as the author, your intent for where this money goes and how it should go. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I It is my intention that this money be whoops, available all across Minnesota. And I think when we look at 65% um, of the resources being greater Minnesota, um, it's recognizing that um, fewer people can cover more ground here in the metro. My intention is absolutely to ensure that um, disadvantaged in communities in the, the metro area and the suburban areas, that communities, land managers, and, and local governments um, throughout our metro area can access this capacity to help ensure that adaptation and resilience is built into their landscape as well, statewide. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience that would like to testify for or against the bill? Anyone else? Representative Acom, any closing comments? Um, thank you very much for the opportunity. I think that this is a, a great um, time and place to be working on important work like this. So thank you for your consideration today. I renew my motion that House File 1853 as amended be recommended to be re-referred to the Climate, Energy, Finance, and Policy Committee. All those in favor, please signify say, by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. No. The motion prevails. <laughs> thank You're you. on your way. Thank you. Thank you. Rep uh, House file 949, Representative Cagle, safety education required and watercraft operators permitted. We've allocated about uh, from 320, which was five minutes ago, to 345, but I know that Representative Cagle is prompt. And so I will move that House file 949 be recommended to be re-referred to the Transportation Finance and Policy Committee. Representative Cagle, I believe you have an A1 author's amendment. 
Yes, Mr. Chair. I move the A1 amendment to get the bill in the form the author would like. Representative Cagle, could you explain the amendment? Um, this is an amendment that would, um, it's for the resort owners, and so it um, just kind of carves out ex uh, resort owners from, from the boater um, safety stuff. Boater. Any discussion on the A1 amendment? Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Chair. Appreciate the amendment. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. The amendment is adopted. Representative Cagle, to the bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, this bill is the Boater Education Bill. Um, so we know that we've had 16,000 new motorized um, watercrafts registered just in the past few years. That's 16,000 additional. So um, sometimes those lakes get kind of crowded. Um, and so this is just making sure that we're, um, just like we do with our um, snowmobiles, that you, you can go in and get um, certified as a safe driver of a boat. And um, we all know how important safety is. So, and I will turn it over to my testifier. Welcome, state your name for the record. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Adam Block. I'm a conservation officer serving as the DNR's Boating Law Administrator for the past five years. I am here today to testify in support of House File 949 that will expand the requirements for boating safety education while on our waterways. In 2022, Minnesota had almost 620,000 motorized boats navigating our waterways. As more and more boaters visit their favorite waterway, we continue to see increased congestion which requires a greater degree of skill and education to safely operate their motorboat. In the 1990s, Minnesota became a leader in the country regarding boating education requirements when we established requirements for our youth to obtain boating safety education if they chose to operate a motorboat. While that was a great first step, Minnesota has been passed by many states across the country who have expanded the requirements over the years. This first step proved that further education saves lives as we saw our boating fatality and injury numbers sharply decline after the youth requirements were signed into law. Minnesotans and many others that visit this state value the experiences and memories made while spending the day on the water. However, too often those experiences and memories end in tragedy. Our 2022 boating fatality report is awaiting final numbers, but currently we have 15 fatalities listed with the average age just shy of 42 years old operating on average a 19-foot motorboat. With the added boating pressure we are experiencing coupled with the amount of tragedy occurring on our waterways, I am asking that you should support House File 949 to protect our waterways and make them safer for all users. Thank you. Next testifier. Jeff Forrester, Minnesota Lakes and Rivers. Good afternoon, Chair, uh, members of the committee. My name is Jeff Forrester. I'm the Executive Director of Minnesota Lakes and Rivers Advocates. We have over 250 lake association members, marina owners, uh, anglers, um, lake home and cabin owners. So I hear from people all across the state. And we've been working on this bill for three years. Um, you know, one of the things I can say about it is we've really worked to find all the different stakeholders. And if you look at that one page that should be in your materials, you'll see kind of the broad range of groups that we've been able to get to support this bill from MinFish, uh, Association of uh, Marina Owners, Association of Boat Manufacturers, um, a lot of different groups have weighed in on this bill. Um, the other thing I'd like to bring up that maybe hasn't been thought about or mentioned before is, you know, as a Minnesotan, if I go out of state um, and try and rent a boat or even overseas and I don't have a license, uh, it can make it difficult. Um, so, you know, while states recognize other states' licenses, if you don't have a license, it can be um, problematic in some areas. Thank you. Next testifier, Tom Watson, Minnesota Coalition of Lake Associations. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today and, and speak on House File 949, which we support. 
My name is Tom Watson. I'm here representing the Minnesota Coalition of Lake Associations. We actually are a group that was formed about 12 years ago representing uh, lake associations that were basically county-based to create a um, broader resource, if you will, to focus on uh, water and lake issues in Minnesota. Uh, I'm a director on the board of directors. There's 12 of us uh, representing large parts of north central Minnesota and certainly northern Minnesota. Um, as well as uh, Ramsey and, and uh, Wright counties. I'm past president of the Whitefish Property Owners Association, which is a nonprofit, um, and chair of the uh, AIS Research Center Advisory Board at the university. I tell you that only because it proves how old I am, uh, and I have been involved in natural resources matters for a long time. As I was driving in this morning, um, I was thinking to myself, um, 65 years ago I drove my first boat, which was an 18-foot Larson wood boat with a 10-horse motor, and my fear was I couldn't get over a wake um, to go 10 miles across Lake Cabotogama that some of you probably know about on the Canadian border. Um, and COLA is an organization that really has been uh, very active in advocacy education and, and encouraging best practices in taking care of our lakes and waters. Um, and as I indicated, we're an organization made up of coalitions of lake associations and, and uh, organizations such as that across the state. Almost no one that I speak with can comprehend why Minnesota doesn't have and has never had a requirement that all boat operators have an education and an operator's license. Given the large number of navigable waters and the size of some of those navigable waters, the amount of and the numbers of registered watercraft, uh, the number of boaters who enjoy those, um, and the increasing size, horsepower, et cetera, of these watercraft. Um, and the recent history as uh, Mr. Block indicated um, of uh, fatalities and very, very serious injuries that we have across the state. Making Minnesota lakes and rivers safer for recreation, supporting water quality initiatives and protecting those waters from negative ecological impacts are a primary focus for our organization and working with our uh, neighboring associations. I might point out we're all volunteers. There's not any money being paid to any of us to do what we do. Uh, last year, in an earlier version, of course, as Mr. Forrester indicated, there was cooperation of a number of organizations, not only lake associations, but local regulatory bodies, as well as manufacturers' organizations and the like. They begin to realize that it was really significant that this watercraft operator's license would make a big difference to boating safety, uh, environmental protections, and just simply a good, good step forward. Um, today, that importance of moving this along um, can't be uh, understated. It's critical as, as uh, we sit here today. The education component of the legislation will make boating safer for all users, uh, along with people of all ages who enjoy the water from a dock or a shore. Uh, if I had the time, I would explain some of what we see for people that probably a little bit of education might have saved a life, uh, might have eliminated some behavior along some water um, on some shoreline, uh, and, uh, and some conversation that's probably not publishable between a boat operator and the property owner or somebody sitting in a 16-foot fishing boat. By addressing aquatic invasive species in the education, uh, we can help boaters understand the impacts of AIS, what it has done to our environment and our ecology, uh, and what we should do to slow down that spread. Um, we also look to the education to protect the shorelines and uh, lake beds and the powerful waves and the impacts uh, that has um, large part, as some of you may know, there's much, quite a bit of research going on at the University of Minnesota that looks at some of the best practices and the impact of propellers and waves and natural wind generated waves and those kinds of matters on our public waters. We believe the education's best practices must consider the wide variety of uses of our public water, whether it's motorized or non-motorized activity, anything from swimming and paddling and fishing to sailing, skiing and surfing. I might note, I don't see grandma and grandpa, and I'm there, grandma and grandpa sitting on a boat at seven o'clock on a Saturday morning anxious to go fishing. You take your life in your hands out there on the water today in many of those cases. And hopefully some of that educational opportunity will teach some people that we all have a right to be there and we all have a right to enjoy it safely. Um, and let's not forget that, you know, water quality is really what drives Minnesotans. There's a couple pieces of research that I won't go into great detail, but one of the questions asked, when people retire, why do you move to your seasonal property in north central Minnesota? Uh, why do you go to your seasonal property? In this case, they were looking at the Fergus Falls Otter Tail area. The number one criteria was water quality. Mm -hmm. Was the number one criteria. 
And so this particular licensure can only help us take care of a valuable, valuable asset that we all um, certainly enjoy. Uh, in conclusion, Mancola looks forward to having the opportunity to work with DNR, further support this particular bill, uh, the author and people that, uh, that she has uh, working on this matter as well with folks at the university. Uh, in conclusion, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity and the time to uh, be here this afternoon and support uh, House File 914. I can tell you Mincola is uh, very anxious to see this passed, as is true of all of the lake associations that are part of our group. We think it is good practice for Minnesota residents, for businesses, and our visitors. Would you enjoy Minnesota? Thank you very much. And I'll stay around if there are any questions. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to testify for or against this bill? Are there any questions? Representative Scrabbit. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, how much will the permit cost, and is there a penalty for nonconformance? Representative Cagle. Thank you. Um, I know that the um, cost of the program or the online thing is about twenty-five dollars. Um, I know I had to. I went through that one. Actually, they mailed me a CD-ROM, so that tells you how long ago <laughs> I had my um, <laughs> my snowmobile endorsement done. But uh, I will leave it over to um, our DNR officer here to to talk about the enforcement. Officer Block. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative. I Senator, or excuse Representative Cagle is correct. Twenty-four ninety-five is what the fee is passed on to the user. In terms of administration of the licensing itself, or issuing a free paper packet, which is available as well, um, as is today, the DNR has a budget for that item that comes out of our RBS Recreational Boating Safety Grant administered through the U.S. Coast Guard. Thank you. Um, so they're going to get a little s slip in the mail. Is that what you you said? Mr. Chair, Representative, Mr. Chair. yes, uh, in theory, it's going to be some something they can hold on to, put in their wallet, their purse, uh, whatever it might be. Thank you. Um, and I know you guys are trying to work on this, but can it not go to this so we can keep it on this? And I know you're working on a program, uh, I, I'm fully aware of it, but somewhere if it's written in there, it can be this too without having to come back. I would be really nice. So just that's the future. Thank you. Representative Cagle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I think, you know, the more we move to kind of digital identity, that we'll have to consider that. But we also, I'm sure um, this will be going to transportation as well because it has to do with our little endorsements on the back of our driver's license. And so I'm sure you'll be able to, to get your um, boating one as well put on your driver's license. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any other questions? Representative uh, Jacob. Uh, just very quickly. So the, does the 2495, does that um, cover all costs or is there still administration costs that the taxpayer would be responsible for? Is 24, 2495 or 2499 that cover everything? Officer Block or Representative Cagle. Mr. Chair, Representative Jacob, correct. That covers the issuance of it through our third party vendor. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair Hansen. Any other questions? Representative Cagle, close. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. I think, um, you know, <laughs> seeing the amount of Airbnbs that have been gone up, going up on my lake, <laughs> I, I want to make sure that folks know the rules and aren't, um, you know, bringing, we have one of the lakes that I, you know, definitely looked at that GIS data for to see what the water quality was. And so I didn't even think about that one until this. And so I think this is, um, this is just really kind of a, a good way to make sure that people know the rules and, um, and also maybe know the, the manners of the lake as well, which I think is kind of something that we um, also need to address. So I appreciate you hearing the bill and hope for your support. I renew my motion that House File 949 as amended be recommended to be re-referred to the Transportation Finance and Policy Committee. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. The motion prevails. Ten seconds early, too, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Next up, uh, House File 1654, Representative Freiberg. Issuance of big game license after conviction modified. You got about 15 minutes. I will move that House File 1654 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Representative Freiberg, to the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Um, so House File 1654 would close the loophole 
uh, where people are pre-buying big game licenses in an effort to avoid revocation penalties. So common types of violations related to big game um, that include revocation include uh, taking over the limit of big game, uh, shining a big game animal, taking big game out of season, hunting under the influence, and hunting over bait. Uh, under current law, a hunter who faces revocation of their big game license upon conviction of a hunting violation could purchase a big game license and then plead guilty. Uh, the revocation period starts upon the conviction date and therefore a license purchased prior to the violation would still be valid even if the season hasn't begun. Uh, the license purchased prior wouldn't be invalidated and this creates a loophole for violators to get around revocation penalties for that year. The bill's intent is to clarify the legislature's intent when it imposed license revocations upon conviction of big game related gross misdemeanor violations, um, hunting big game without a license, or for a second conviction within three years related to the taking of big game. With this bill, any big game license an individual possesses at the time of a conviction will be invalid immediately upon that conviction. Approximately 500,000 people purchase deer hunting licenses in Minnesota each year, but this would affect only approximately 250 uh, big game revocations issued annually. Uh, so with that summary, I am happy to turn it over to my testifiers. Robert Gorecki, Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for uh, hearing this bill. The DNR supports this bill. I, I don't think I could have said it better than, than the representative. This bill is a very stro short, straightforward, and common sense, sense technical modification of Minnesota Statute 97A.421. It essentially, like the representative said, closes that loophole of people, quote unquote, pre-buying licenses in an uh, attempt to avoid uh, revocation of their of their privileges and yet it still uh, clarifies again the legislative intent and still maintains people's judicial and due process rights which of course we all want to see so I don't think there's anything else to say about it if you could just state your name for the record major Robert Grecki operations manager for the DNR enforcement division thank you uh, next testifier <laughs> Eric Simonson Minnesota Deer Hunters Association Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Eric Simonson. I represent the Minnesota Deer Hunters Association. Uh, members, we are we are an association that really drives a policy agenda that's set by deer hunters for deer hunters. Um, and we've heard really good description of what the bill is. I'm not going to repeat things that were said. But the violators that we're talking about, even though it's a small number, can have a really detrimental impact on the industry itself as well as the image of deer hunters all across the state. We support the clarifying and the, uh, the clarifying language and the intent of the original law, uh, and as such, we support House File 1654. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience that would like to testify for or against the bill? Questions from members? Representative Heisman. Thank you, Chair. We keep hearing that it's a relatively small number, but it would be kind of nice to know how many if it hasn't been already mentioned. I could have missed it, but. Officer Gorecki. Or Representative Hy Hybrid. Sure. Uh, yeah, I mentioned in the testimony that uh, approximately 500,000 people purchase deer hunting licenses, but this bill would affect only 250 big game revocations issued annually. So it's, I think that's less than a percent. Thank you, Chair. I believe I might have missed that, but thank you. Any other questions? I'd like to close. Uh, thank you for your consideration. I think this is an important bill that will close a loophole and uh, encourage members to support it. I renew my motion that House File 1654 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. The bill is laid over. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Representative Vang. House file 1834, scientific and natural area funding provided and money appropriated. Representative Ang, would you like to move that House file 1834 be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill? Yes, so moved. Representative Vang, I believe you have an A1 author's amendment. Would you like to move your amendment and yes. explain it briefly? Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, I will move the A1 amendment. Uh, the A1 amendment just makes uh, date changes uh, to uh, to give more time to spend the funds. Any question about the A1 amendment? Representative Vang moves the A1 amendment to get the bill in the form she would like. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ayes have it, the A1 amendment is adopted. Representative Vang, I'd like to also move the A3 amendment now, if we could. 
Yeah, so the A3 amendment, I would like to move the A3 amendment. Uh, this is, I believe, is your amendment, Mr. Chair, that just adds $6 million for acquisition and improved maintenance and restoration uh, at the Gray Clouds Dune Scientific and Natural Area. Is there any questions for members? Any questions? Representative Hyphen? You're referring to the amendment, correct? The amendment, yeah. Um, I, I'm fine, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. The amendment is adopted. Representative Vang, to the bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, this is a pretty straightforward bill, $6 million to support and maintain Minnesota scientific and natural areas. Uh, these are important natural reserves for native plants, animals, rare species, and allows us to research and study about Minnesota's natural features. Uh, SNAs are also open to recreational activities like bird watching, nature photography, and hiking. Uh, these areas have far too long been overlooked and a serious lack of funding to maintain these areas have been long overdue. And this bill will ensure we continue to protect and preserve Minnesota's ecosystem logical features and with that I'll yield my time to my testifiers Mr. Chair. Uh, Tim Johnson, Friends of Minnesota Scientific and Natural Areas. Welcome, state your name for the record. Good afternoon Chairman Hansen and members of the committee. My name is Tim Johnson. I'm uh, uh, not an expert on science um, except from the perspective of health, I'm a, re a retired ICU nurse, but I've always treasured the uh, important features of our natural environment around us. I joined the Friends of uh, Minnesota Scientific Area a few years back, and I've been keeping up on what's been going on. Fortunately, our organization, uh, 5013C, um, has one of its officers of former retired uh, <coughs> director of the SNA program, um, Mr. Bob Chubstrom. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here today, so I hope that I can uh, include most of the points that he would have made if he were able to be here. Our mission at the, at the uh, Friends of the Scientific and National Areas is <coughs> stated on our website, to advocate for the establishment the use management and the perpetuation of Minnesota's scientific and natural areas in an undisturbed natural state. We refer to our SNAs as the crown jewels of our state's public lands. They contain over 25% of Minnesota's rare plant and animal species and native plant communities. They're great treasures and invaluable re reservoirs of genetic material needed in the future and a world threatened by climate change. We're here to support House File 1834 because it will provide the essential general funds for maintaining and managing scientific and natural areas already acquired with experienced staff to meet the program's needs. The general funds for the SNA program have been diminishing over the last two decades and the results of the consequent lack of maintenance are apparent. Exotic invasives can be seen encroaching in many sensitive places. I've personally visited over 50 of them myself, and it's really heartbreaking to see how many of these important remaining remnants of our state ecosystems are suffering from this lack of proper maintenance. An ongoing base of general funds for the SNA program is essential to ensure that experienced staff will be present from year to year. We need to assure the employees that their positions will continue beyond a two-year funding cycle. Only general funds can be depended upon to provide this continuity from year to year by allowing the retention of knowledgeable, trained, and experienced staff. Experienced staff know the over 160 SNA sites and numerous Prairie Bank sites that are also administered in this program. There are, they are familiar with the particular needs and management strategies for individual sites. They're in the best position to personally know the adjacent landowners, <coughs> the issues associated with any site, and to follow through on the long-term commitments that have been made. They're also necessary to monitor management, 
and maintenance projects to ensure actions taken are not threatening the rare resources that they are that they achieve their desired results. Because of their knowledge, they're in the best position to direct temporary funds from the Legislative Citizen Commission of Minnesota Resources, the LCCMR, and the Lassard Sam's Outdoor Heritage Council for management and maintenance. Experienced staff don't require training every two year funding cycle, and they can serve as prescribed burn bosses training temporary crews hired to do the necessary prescribed burns on which many of these ecosystems are dependent. While the LCCMR and OHC funds are important, there's no assurance that they'll be directed to the SNA program every biennium. We need an ongoing base from the general fund. So we strongly encourage the committee to approve this important piece of legislation. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Heidi Wolf, Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. <coughs> Welcome. State your name for the record. Heidi Wolf, I'm the EMP section manager for Department of Natural Resources. I'll proceed. Representative Hansen and uh, members, Chair Hansen and representatives. As uh, Representative Vang said, SNEs are a very important part of Minnesota's landscape. I think that uh, both she and Mr. Johnson noted that funding is an issue for SNAs. They are mainly funded about 90% by the Environmental and Natural Resource Trust Fund and the Outdoor Heritage Fund. The challenge is that these two funds don't allow some of the other important work on SNAs that need to be done, including general site maintenance, administration of the program, training and application for the grants themselves, as well as certain acquisitions. General fund would be extremely important for the scenic and nat scientific and natural areas to maintain the work that we're doing and move <coughs> on into the future and it would fill some of the gaps that we currently have with our grant programs. Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to testify for or against the bill? <coughs> Members, any questions? Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Chair. Um, if we could go back to the A3, that was kind of where I was headed, but we can talk about it now. Is there some idea what we're getting for $6 million? I mean, in the, in the amendment, it says improve maintenance and restoration. What is that exactly? Representative Heinzman, Representative Vang, should I take that one? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, Representative Heinzman, so there is a potential opportunity with Gray Cloud Island uh, Township and Cottage Grove uh, a development proposal just fell through next to an SNA. There may be some opportunity for a land swap for other properties that uh, the DNR owns. Uh, I chose the six million because it was equal to the amount of the existing uh, bill and it would be in addition to it. I view it as a placeholder uh, for an opportunity that may be moving relatively fast. It does, the uh, amendment talks about acquisition but also restoration and maintenance. And maybe uh, Ms. Wolf could just say of Great Cloud Island Township, the SNA in that area, describing that. Yes, um, so Great Cloud's in Region 3 in um, St. Paul area, and we are very excited about that potential uh, opportunities there, again, about all SNAs in support of them, and we support both of these bills. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Chair. You, you know, I, I think that it's been an ongoing conversation. We've talked a lot about trying to make sure we're picking up parcels for uh, in this in this region of the state. And so, on one hand, I I think that you know that's something we got to be talking about because it's important that we have more public land regionally here. Uh, on the other, I wish that it wasn't something that was tapping our our general fund. I know that there is a big surplus. Um, but of course, it's nice to be able to find those kinds of acquisitions, fee title, uh, you know, and we have so many other places where that could be funded. So I, I don't know if this is the beginning and the end of it and this is just gonna happen or if there's more conversation that could happen, but I appreciate the clarification, I guess. And Representative Heinzman, the programs that were referenced earlier, whether it's Outdoor Heritage or LCSMR, you have to apply and there's a lag period. 
the idea here is this may be moving relatively quickly, and I use I want to underline may, may move very quickly, yep. and there may be a land swap opportunity. So uh, the idea is to actually name it here so we have the discussion and have this out in the open, and hopefully I'm happy to work with you guys on this. If, if I could, Mr. Chair. Representative Heinzman. Um, after having served on the Lassard SAMs and on the LCCMR, a number of these groups that often are working towards fee title, you and I both know that it's, it's not unusual for many of the groups to have dollars sitting on the bottom line waiting for properties to become available. So before there's general fund money, um, and, and it's a pretty significant amount of money, $6 million, before that happens, I just hope that other uh, avenues to which could potentially help secure this, you know, and maybe even a match of some kind. Um, we we're always looking towards trying to find how we can, you know, use those opportunities most effectively to stretch taxpayer dollars. And this is happening really fast. So if there was another way to uh, avoid the general fund, I would suggest that we find that. Representative Vang. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Reps and Heitzman. Uh, that is duly noted, and I can be open to working with you on that, too, and with Mr. Chair as well. Any other questions? Seeing none, would you like to close, Representative Vang? Uh, this is a good bill, and thank you to the members of the committee for your support. <clears throat> and I renew my motion to have this bill laid over for possible inclusion. Representative Vang re renews her motion in House File 1834, as amended, to be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. The bill is laid over. Okay. And we will swap. Chairs Representative Hansen, would you like to move your bill? I will move the House file 2082 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. And Representative Hansen, I believe you have the DE1 author's amendment. Would you like to move your amendment and explain it? Yes, uh, Madam Chair, I will move the DE1 author's amendment. Members, this provides some additional, uh, I'd call this an AIS minibus bill um, relating to aquatic invasive species research and implementation. We are providing uh, content that has been uh, put out in bills previously and also providing some supplemental dollars on line 3.15 uh, from the general fund uh, for MACERC to supplement the center's starry stonework research. So uh, you will see uh, in the sections, section one is requiring a management plan uh, f every five years on aquatic invasive species. We debated that last year when uh, I think Representative Acom had that on the impacts of climate change on invasive species man management, aquatic invasive species management. Um, you have the appropriation and the appropriation in the original bill and that is carried in the DE1. Uh, we have been investing at the University of Minnesota in aquatic invasives research for several years. And my question to Dr. Phelps who will be testifying is how do we move to implementation? What are we, we've been doing research for a long time, how do we implement any practices? What do we achieve uh, with the investment? How do we move towards uh, arresting the pests uh, for a, aquatic invasive species? And so that's what you see in section three. And I'd ask your support for the DE1 amendment. Representative Hansen moves the DE1 amendment to get the bill in the form he would like. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. The motion prevails and the DE1 amendment is adopted. Representative Hansen to your bill as amended. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I have uh, Dr. Nicholas Phelps of the Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center. 
Dr. Phelps, um, please come on down, um, state your name for the record, and proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, committee. Um, I'm Dr. Nick Phelps. I am the director of the Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center, often referred to as MACERC, and also an associate professor in the Department of Fisheries, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology at the University of Minnesota. Thanks, um, on behalf of our research teams, thanks for having me here today to speak on behalf of House File 2082. Um, I'll get to the point. Uh, there isn't a house district in this state, including all of yours, that isn't currently struggling with the challenges of aquatic invasive species. You have managers and constituents dealing with this um, every day. Um, zebra mussels, common carp, Eurasian water milfoil, and many more are fundamentally re-engineering our ecosystems. They're changing the way that we can use our water, and they cost the state millions every year in direct management costs. Aquatic invasive species, simply put, are a real and growing problem. But, and I believe this wholeheartedly, they are a problem that we can solve with innovative science, strong partnerships, and state support. I have this sense of optimism because I watch the front lines of the research progress closely. MACERC researchers are making progress on many fronts, working closely with partners to fill knowledge gaps and create tools. I don't have the time now. This isn't a talk about the work that we're doing necessarily. Um, if you have interest in talking about the science, I'm happy to follow up. Or if you want to come to the lab or get out on a boat, I'm happy to make that happen as well. The point that I, I want to emphasize here is that we've got a real opportunity to build on our success and the research progress and make a difference with this bill. The purpose of Section 3 of House File 2082, as Representative Hansen has indicated, is to move MACERC science from the lab to the lake by bringing together teams of researchers and managers from tribal, state, and local agencies to plan, implement, and evaluate research-based management strategies at scales not currently possible with available research and management funding. We are ready, and I'm serious, we're ready to take some big swings at these problems, um, especially those that are listed here in the bill. Um, and while I'm, I want to stress that we're going to have to, as this uh, moves forward, to co-develop the details of these projects with managers and partners. Um, I want to highlight one of the opportunities that's here and happy to talk more if you've got questions on the others. Um, there's been significant research that's been conducted to develop management tools for common carp, which is one of Minnesota's most ecologically damaging invasive species. Small-scale implementation of the research has proven successful at reducing carp biomass and dramatically improving water quality. MACERC-led efforts are currently underway in coordination with the Clean Water Council, DNR, Bowser, the PCA, and many others to host a series of workshops to develop an actionable carp management framework and identify policy recommendations to make that happen. Funding from this bill could facilitate the implementation of a watershed scale carp management plan using MACERC developed research strategies and include additional research focused on site specific method refinement, economic development, organizational effectiveness, um, evaluation, particularly with respect to water quality and ecosystem services. The same sort of points that I want to be clear about in that one example um, that are true for the other projects identified in this bill are that the uh, research is ready for large-scale testing. Second is that we have um, in the state diverse partnerships and those are getting stronger all the time and we am confident we could quickly and efficiently leverage that capacity to implement the science. Um, I'm optimistic that the outcomes of these projects um, could be our next big AIS success story. It's time we take a chance on the research, implement it, and see the difference that we can make. So thanks again, everybody, for the time, and I'm happy to answer questions if you have some. Thank you, Dr. Phelps. Next on my list is Jeff Forrester from Minnesota Lakes and Rivers. Mr. Forrester, welcome back. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Yes, uh, my name is uh, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Jeff Forrester, Executive Director of Minnesota Lakes and Rivers. And I'd like to thank uh, Representative Hansen for bringing this forward um, and just really kind of emphasize what Dr. Phelps was talking about with, you know, over, I think it's a decade of research now 
and I was in the room when the when Maserk was was first being proposed, and uh, Peter Sorison said it's going to take a 10-year commitment to start to come up with solutions, and he was about right. And so now, how do we get these things on the ground? And I think this is a really good start to that. Thank you. Great. A any questions? Or? Um, we'll go to questions after we finish all the testimony. Um, next on my list, though, is Tom Watson from the Minnesota Coalition of Lake Associations. Mr. Watson, welcome back. Please state your name for the record when you get comfortable in your seat, and then proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair. Um, and committee members, again, um, Tom Watson, and I'm a director of the uh, uh, Minnesota Coalition of Lake Associations, but also in full disclosure, I'm the volunteer chair of the uh, Center Advisory Board at the uh, University of Minnesota AS Research Center. I wasn't there when uh, Mr. Forrester indicated that he and Sorensen and others were talking about the tenure life. I've heard that matter because I have been around that long. Um, what, what strikes me is I wanted to share with you the support we have for this particular initiative and appreciate Representative Hansen bringing that forward. One only has to look at the number of invasive species that do exist in Minnesota and or threatening Minnesota. They're on our doorsteps uh, in a variety of places. That list is long and it's impressive. And at the moment, um, I think Nick would indicate they're tackling you know, 12, 15 of these at the moment. Um, one of the critical things we realized as MACERC was going along, and I've been involved with their board now for about five years, um, it's what I refer to as the life cycle of businesses. In other words, MACERC, not unlike human beings, gets born, it goes through infancy, it moves on to an adolescent life, and then becomes an adult. One of the things we do in business, which is my background, is we look for some kind of sustainable financing to keep the enterprise running. MACERC is at that point. One of the things that we as lake associations across Minnesota talk about with Nick quite frequently is, what do we need to do to um, help you create that sustainable base so that your researchers aren't spending half their, their day um, writing grants, spending time out looking for money, um, but rather are doing this important piece of research Number two, um, the question about, um, you know, how do we see this moving on from research to implementation? I can tell you a couple, three things that are critically valuable to those of us that are on the, on the ground that are working in our lake associations across the state of Minnesota. Number one, we always can count on the folks at the University of AIS Research Center to come to our communities, to come to our areas. For example, I have now been doing eight years of an AIS roundtable in Cross Lake, Minnesota, in which we attract about 100 people for four hours on a Saturday morning. We bring in the researchers who are uh, working on latest research. In many cases, these are master's degree folks working on PhDs. Uh, we get an update on what's happening with uh, MACERC and latest research from, from Dr. Um, Nick himself. Um, it's critically important. Number two, um, they do a, an incredible amount of outreach to our local communities. I don't get to conduct this program, for example, that I'm just describing without the help of one of Nick's staff who helps arrange for all those speakers and they bring information. I don't know how many of you spend your time doing these things, but last year I learned, uh, two years ago in the last year, I learned about um, the, the uh, hybrid cattail. I thought a cattail was a cattail, uh, only to discover we got hybrid cattails that are not doing us any favors. And so we brought in the researcher to talk about that. What is all the point of this? It's what I said really earlier with respect to the boating matter. Most of us realize in Minnesota the thing that's extremely valuable to all of us is the quality of our lakes, quality of our streams, quality of, our, of these bodies of water. They're public bodies of water. Right now they're infested with critically three or four items. If you talk to people about what items of AIS are critically valuable or a quick, quick a focus for research and attention, whatever, zebra mussels is number one. Uh, Eurasian milfoil might be number two. Um, now all of a sudden some people are concerned about starry stonewort because it actually went from uh, Lake Coronas to, uh, to Beltrami County. We haven't figured, I don't know if we figured out how it got there other than through human beings. Um, but these are the kinds of things that, that impact people's decisions about uh, how they act. 
What are we doing with faucet snails? Well, we got some evidence of that. What are we doing with spiny water flea? We're seeing that. Lakes in which are infested with zebra mussels and spiny water flea at the moment have walleye and perch populations that are smaller in size as a result of that. Um, the, the significance to this for most of us is the fact that um, this is a funding piece that will help MACERC move to that next phase of development. It's got unbelievable amounts of research. I can tell you we just went through looking at, at proposals and, and these kinds of matters each year as we do that. I'm astounded by the number and the depth and the kind of development. Everybody thinks that one of the things Nick's team does is look at a species of AIS, in other words, the next one. In some cases, they're actually developing management tools for folks in these lake associations. Crow Wing County, for example, distributes about $500,000 for watercraft inspection, and they rely on a, an intelligent system designed by MACER to help look at lakes and the distribution of that money to its uh, highest value, best return, in using that particular tool. It's working uh, across the state. And very last, I would say, uh, MACER is, is a partner for all of us. Um, I don't know what we would have done had we not been going through this whole experience over the last number of years. And I would just remind us that the very significant thing that occurs in Minnesota as a result of all of this, and I'll throw a number out, I know Representative Heitzman probably already knows this, but I'll use it. If you take Hubbard County, Cass County, Crow Wing County, and you look at the amount of sales tax and income tax generated by businesses and persons doing business in those areas, in the state of Minnesota prior to COVID-19, that was only exceeded by, the dollar amount was only exceeded by Hennepin and Ramsey County. And you know what? We don't have a pro football team or we don't have a pro sport team. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Watson. Um, the last test fire I have is uh, Heidi Wolf from the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. Welcome back, Ms. Wolf. Um, please say your name again for the tape and then proceed with your testimony. Madam Chair and Representatives, my name is Heidi Wolf. I am the section manager for the EMP section at Minnesota DNR. Go ahead. So uh, DNR is excited to see MACERC moving on to the future and having additional funding. We do have questions about some of the this work that's being done. We've had some conversations that supported MACERC through the last couple of years of zebra mussel research and would want to continue to work closely with them to make sure that things like copper treatments weren't um, degrading Minnesota's lakes or harming native species. But we are excited to see funding for MACERC and then moving forward for sure. Great. Is there anyone else in the audience that would like to testify for or against this bill? And then we'll go on to question from members. First on my list is Representative Scraba. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted uh, your comment was, we're doing this on the ground, and I said, in the water. <laughs> Thank you Thank for you. correcting the record, Representative Thank you. Scrub. That was very important for us to be, to be accurate in this committee. Uh, next on my list is uh, Representative Gilman. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I'm not sure if this question would be for Representative Hansen or Dr. Phelps. I'm curious because I'm new um, and we talk about um, the last 10 years will be 11 years now. How much has the legislature appropriated um, in total to, um, to since its inception? I'd just love to know that. Representative Hansen, do you? Thank you, Madam Chair. And Representative Gilman, I think Mr. Hagemeyer is looking up. Maybe it's a duel between him and uh, Ooh, cool. Dr. Phil. Mr. Hagemeyer. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Hansen, uh, I think maybe the test fair would be able to better give a representation for the last 10 years. It has, it started with trust fund appropriations and has continued to receive trust fund appropriations since its inception, not every year, but most of the years. I think the first two are 5 million each year and then it's been, I think there was 5 million in 20, I was just looking up a minute ago, 20, fiscal year 21, three and a half million in fiscal, 22 and then more recently there's been some general fund and then game and fish fund appropriations to the center as well but over the last 10 years i'm sure the test fire could give you a better idea dr phelps representative hansen oh. yeah madam chair and representative um, thanks for the question i don't have the exact number um off the top of my head 
from the LCCMR, it's roughly 15, 16 million dollars. And at this point, we get about a million dollars each year from the Environment Committee, uh, about split half and half from the General Fund and the Game and Fish Fund. And we've been receiving those appropriations for the last several biennia. Representative Hansen. And Madam Chair, Representative Gilman, we had attempted to make that jump to uh, ongoing funding uh, through a fee, uh, an AIS fee. Uh, in the last four years, there was efforts to do that, to take it off the Environmental Trust Fund uh, for the for the focus. Um, in negotiations, instead of going for the fee, we provided increasing amount of general fund uh, to the center. So that's why the the dollars that are there for the general fund. But we can get a breakdown of per year since it occurred. But the bulk of it has been through the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund. Thank you. Representative Gilman. Well, thanks. Appreciate it. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Representative Hansen, we've gone back and forth in this a little bit already today, but just want to confirm, would it be an option to fund this appropriation through the ENRTF again? Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Representative Heinzman. Yes, it would be. Uh, I would prefer us to uh, get off that train uh, or not be so reliant on the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund so that new catalytic, you know, new innovative, brand new types of research can maybe have the same opportunity as what started there. Um, you know, if we, if it does go through the RFP, uh, hopefully we'll be continuing that. The Environmental and Natural Resources Trust Fund continues in perpetuity. The allocation to it does not. So there will be dollars there. It would be my hope that we're not spending um, that Dr. Phelps uh, and or his successors don't have to keep going to the trust fund. I realize that may be a different opinion than others, but I think getting it, uh, that's why I'm using the general fund one time surplus here for a four year appropriation to assist with getting off the trust fund. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Chair. No, I think it's important just to note that um, we're gonna be seeing the recommendations from the LCCMR at some point and I, I hope that uh, um, one way or another we find dollars for this. And uh, I think that we, looking back to 2012, this took a bipartisan effort to uh, make this a reality, to bring the MASRIC into uh, fruition. And it's been a bipartisan effort ever since. And the work that goes on there is, is absolutely critical. And we're glad to see that, as the uh, testimony suggested, that we're moving past, you know, sort of the infancy and the growth, you know, uh, timeline and into implementation. And I, I just think that's absolutely phenomenal. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. I think that we're continuing to see, though, unfortunately, a lot of uh, uh, bills coming in recent weeks, totaling significant hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, billions now. And I'm worried that there's going to be items that fall off um, and don't get funded. And so we got to be covering our bases and make sure that those that one way or another we get funding. And if it is an option to fund through the uh, ENRTF, we have till 2025 in the existing timeline. Uh, let's not uh, miss an opportunity if there is one. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and Representative Heinzman, as you know, we're kind of in a counter cyclical where one cycle it'll be AIS and then the next cycle it's terrestrial and now we've added an, a third center in with the prion center so you've got three very large entities that are in a, a cycle looking for the environment and natural resources trust fund we have moved the appropriations bill out of this committee uh, and I believe it's even gone through ways and means uh, so it's uh, for the recommendations for the uh, LCCMR so uh, I would encourage uh, you know, support for this. Uh, you know, the other option would be uh, to have that long-term funding come from fees. And I think there's probably some opposition to that uh, as well. So needed work, but the work needs to be paid for. Um, I will add that, uh, and thank you, Dr. Phelps. I went to a, um, Maser invited me and then Representative Jurgens to um, see, to visit their site and to see the boat and to see the work that was going on um, by your researchers and graduate students. Um, and they did a fine job. And not only did they educate both Representative Jurgens and I, but there were a number of, uh, of 
of just community members. It was an open event, and, and a lot of people came and, and learned a lot about zebra mussels and how to care for their watercraft and stop the spread. So thank you for that. Um, it, was, it was very informative. Is there any further discussion to the bill? Uh, Representative Hansen, closing comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. This uh, labs to lakes proposal is very important. It makes the makes that jump, starts moving towards implementation, which is, I think, a goal. How do we uh, arrest the pests that are there? So I would ask for your support. Uh, I will move that House File uh, is uh, 2082 uh, as amended to be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Representative Hansen renews his motion that House File 2082 as amended be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill and the bill is laid over. Um, next up is House File 955, another Chair Hansen bill. Financial assurance required for feedlot permits, inventories and reports required and money appropriated. Um, as people are shuffling in and out, Representative Hansen, would you like to move your bill? Thank you, Madam Chair. I would move that House File 955 uh, be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Representative Hansen, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. House File 955 is uh, similar, if not uh, the same, as a bill that was introduced, heard, and passed off the House floor as part of the omnibus bill last year. Uh, you may remember the testimony looking at the question of abandoned feedlots. Uh, so what the bill does are kind of two components. Uh, the first uh, is the requirement for financial assurance, kind of goes back to our discussion yesterday that we had about uh, whose responsibility is it to clean up uh, when there are problems at the end of life. Uh, it has uh, defines and a description of abandoned manure storage areas. Uh, it provides uh, a feedlot assurance, financial assurance compliance schedule. Uh, and then it requires some manure storage area reports uh, on looking at uh, how many are there of, of these abandoned feedlots. So uh, we have different me uh, members who have been on the committee and members who are new to the committee. We do have committee counties where there are delegated authorities with feedlots and, and some committee counties where there are not. So we have to have some descriptions about those in the bill, it does provide money uh, from the general fund to implement, uh, to the PCA to implement financial assurance requirements and compile an annual list of abandoned manure storage areas. It also provides money to the delegated counties based on the number of feedlots uh, for inspection. Uh, and then, uh, so these are one-time appropriations. And then a grant to the Minnesota Association of County Feedlot Officers to provide training. And then it provides some money from the environmental fund to the commissioner uh, uh, also to implement the feedlot uh, financial assurance requirements and compile the list of abandonment or storage areas. And I believe there are a number of testifiers. There are. Um, and first on the list is Amanda Kohler from the Land Stewardship Project. Uh, Ms. Kohler, when you get to the table, please uh, repeat your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. Um, thank you for having me today. My name is Amanda Kohler. I am the policy manager at the Land Stewardship Project. LSP is a grassroots organization built with the mission of having a just and sustainable farm and food system and healthy communities. We have approximately 4,500 households in our membership, including approximately 1,500 small and mid-sized farmers. LSP strongly supports House File 955, if a feedlot or manure lagoon is not properly closed, there are several environmental health and safety hazards. According to the MPCA's website itself, runoff and seepage from abandoned feedlots and manure lagoons can cause water pollution. Abandoned manure lagoons can uh, be a potential source of detrimental gases such as hydrogen sulfide, which is hazardous to human health, and it can present a drowning uh, hazard. This is particularly important for southeastern Minnesota, where the region's unique karst geology puts rural communities at even more risk. In fact, on three separate occasions, sinkholes caused by the, the region's unique karst geology opened beneath manure lagoons in Lewiston, Altura, and Belchester, emptying millions of gallons of, water, of manure into our groundwater systems. With many southeastern Minnesota residents already unable to drink from their tap, including one of our own offices in, in Lewiston, Minnesota, um, 
The risk of improperly closed manure lagoons further contaminating drinking water and air is just too great. Rural communities should be able to rely on these large scale facilities to properly close feedlots and manure lagoons, ensuring that these operations have the resources to do so before they are permitted is just common sense. Taxpayers should not have to bear the cost of any unintended consequences from these facilities. Based on MPCA registered feedlot data, this would impact only the largest 2% of beef operations, 7% of dairy operations, and 24% of hog operations, as, as that's a further consolidated industry. And this, should this bill become law, it's not going to impact a majority of farmers in Minnesota. It's also common sense to just have a grasp on the number of abandoned, of potentially abandoned feedlots in the state. And because, um, you know, as you can imagine, it can be challenging for greater Minnesotans to, to drive and, and be here in person. And uh, I wanted to share two quotes from LSP farmer members who, who wanted to be here but couldn't. From Vance Haugen in Fillmore County, quote, as a feedlot permit holder and a dairy farmer, I think this new legislation to hold manure storage owners accountable is excellent. From Beth Slocum in Goodhue County, quote, animal feedlot owners like myself need to be financially responsible for any leaks or failures of their manure pits or lagoons. When problems have occurred with failures of manure holding facilities, municipalities and rural community members have had to bear the cost of remediating contamination to their water supplies. So thank you to Representative Hansen for driving this bill and to the committee for considering the bill. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Next on my list is Lucas. A lot of consonants here. Joestrums. Jo Please correct your name uh, pronunciation. <laughs> um, for the record, I know you're from Minnesota Milk. I can read those words. Um, and then proceed with your testimony. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, committee members. Uh, my name is Lucas Showstrom. Uh, in the north part of the state, it might be Schustrom, but for me, it's Showstrom. And I serve as director, executive director of the Minnesota Milk Producers Association, also a dairy farmer from Bruton, Minnesota. Um, thank you for continuing to allow us to come in and testify, especially on blizzard days like today. Uh, this, this bill, uh, House File 955, feels a bit like a solution looking for a problem uh, that doesn't exist and hasn't occurred in the past to my knowledge and anything we can find. It would also add costs related to financial assurance to the state, local government, and certainly farmers targeted with, with the, excuse me, within the bill. But in doing that, it also hurts farms not directly targeted in the bill. Neighboring farms that may or may not have livestock, supply crops, and accept manure from these facilities as fertilizer. So whenever credit is tied up, it gets more expensive with benefit to our lenders and not our farmers. And further, specifically to the first part of the bill, uh, SDS, our, our state disposal permit part 721 through 726 specifically talk about closure and general permit of NPDES part 23.1 through 23.5 clearly spell out closure for producers at this size. And I think it's, it's done well and, and quite clearly actually. Uh, with yearly or more plants and inspections, abandonment does not seem possible under almost all circumstances. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Schustrom. Uh, next on my list is Daryl Timmerman. Um, and then on deck is Pierce Bennett. Uh, Mr. Timmerman. From the Minnesota Pork Producers Association, please uh, repeat your name for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Uh, Madam Chair and committee members, thank you for the opportunity to testify here. My name is Daryl Timmerman. Um, I, I live in Nicola County, just across the river from Mankato, and uh, I currently serve as the president of the Minnesota Pork Producers Association. Uh, we're gonna, we are an organization representing Minnesota's 3,000 family pig farmers. Uh, with respect to House File 955, we are concerned about the bill as it's written today. We believe the additional requirement for financial assurance on feedlot permits over 1,000 animal units creates an additional unnecessary barrier for our new and beginning farmers, as well as those looking to grow or expand their farms, or even to further diversify or create opportunities for the next generation on the farm. These financial assurances would further increase the uncompetitive nature of raising livestock, specifically pigs, here in the state of Minnesota. As pig farmers, we have a strong track record of properly managing our barns and facilities in a way that preserves the value of the asset. 
This creates opportunity for someone else to purchase the barn or to convert the facilities to serve another purpose if a farmer chooses to exit the business or experiences economic hardship. Ultimately, true abandonment is an extremely unlikely event. Because of current permitting requirements of feedlots over 1,000 animal units, there are annual reporting requirements that would enable the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency to stay informed of the potential abandonment of these feedlots. There's already guidance in place for the proper closure of a feedlot, including the manure storage areas, to ensure they are not an environmental or a safety threat. As pig farmers, we are committed to responsibly operating within our permits and doing what is right for our animals, our communities, and the environment. Our goal is to raise healthy animals and provide nutritious, affordable protein for hungry people that also supports our families and rural communities. We hope to continue engaging Chair Hansen in discussion on this topic and truly appreciate the opportunity to share our concerns here today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next on my list is Pierce Bennett from the Minnesota Farm Bureau Federation. Um, and then I have Douglas Ayers, I believe. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Bennett. Please state your name for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair. My name is Pierce. Oh. <clears throat> Excuse me, my name is Pierce Bennett, Director of Public Policy with the Minnesota Farm Bureau Federation, where I have the privilege of representing nearly 30,000 farm and ranch families across the state of Minnesota. Um, as we've heard from some previous testifiers, we also come here to testify with concerns about HF 955. We share the concern that this could be, that this bill could become a barrier to entry and to expansion for operations. It could lead to an inability for farmers to be able to have the finances available to both meet these requirements and receive the funding to operate and own the facilities. We want to give farmers more and more opportunities to participate in these industries. We know there are permitting rules and regulations already in place that seek to protect our environment. And as we have heard previously, we are unaware of these vast or a major issue arising when it comes to abandoned facilities of this nature. We feel as though this bill is searching for a problem that may not be there, but we are open to continuing having conversations with Chair Hansen, and we appreciate the opportunity to testify on this bill today. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, last on my list is Douglas Ayers, uh, Dodge County Concerned Citizens. Um, welcome to the committee. Please uh, state the correct pronunciation of your name and then proceed with your testimony. My name is Douglas Ayers and um, I'm representing Dodge County Concerned Citizens and I speak in favor of this bill and I appreciate the Environment and Natural Resources Finance and Policy Committee for taking this up. I also appreciate Representative Hansen for sponsoring this bill. Um, Dodge County is in southern Minnesota. It's uh, between Rochester and Owatonna. It's my home county where I grew up. It's a very heavy agricultural county. The whole history of the county is agricultural. And um, it's animal agriculture. <clears throat> and we have, I speak directly mostly about the swine industry because this is the area of animal agriculture that I know the most about. So I can address that with you. Um, the uh, county has about 22,000 residents in the county, and we have over 250,000 hogs in the county. So 10 times. I mean, you got huge manure management issues that we have to deal with in the county. Now, it's just going to show two, two quick uh, things. We're not conducive here to images, but they say a picture is worth a 1,000 words. This is the registered feedlots in the state of Minnesota. And Dodge County is right here, heavily in red. And this part of the uh, state is very heavy animal agriculture, but all along the southern counties. And a lot of these counties are representative, represented by uh, Republican state legislators, but this is not a Democrat or Republican issue, in my opinion. This is a nonpartisan issue. This is an environmental issue. But these are the registered feedlots in the county, or in the state, the red. And <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, 
a typical swine facility, that's what we call an industrial facility, a confined animal feeding unit, houses 2,400 hogs in our county, and they typically place them one to three side by side. So when you do 2,400 hogs times three, you're doing you know 7,500 hogs or whatever, 70, 7,200 hogs. Each facility produces 1.1 million gallons of manure a year. That's as much as 2,400, a town of 2,400 people. So they have to move that manure onto land to get rid of it. <clears throat> I've got another photo here showing application of manure in Dodge County because a lot of the people here, the legislature, you've never seen these pictures before and you've never been there when they're doing this. But this is a picture in Dodge County. This is a manure applicator that's an industrial uh, unit and it's a tanker unit unloading the manure from the pit. They take it out to the fields and they have to put it in the transfer to the tanker and then they have to inject it into the field. This had it injectors, a lot of them don't. They just put it on the top of the land. But when they do this, <clears throat> two things. You don't want that wheel to roll over your foot because you're gonna lose your big toe. That's very heavy. These machine, this machinery is very heavy. Second of all, if there's any spillage, you got an environmental problem. You also don't want to be, that was taken in November because they typically uh, empty the pits in November or in uh, April during the time when they're preparing for application of uh, crops or when they're har that they've already harvested. And we have dozens and dozens and dozens of those CAFOs in our county and there's no plan to remediate an uh, old building. There's no, there's no plan for it. Typical buildings last 30, maybe 30 years. I know the oldest ones in our area, they go back to about 1993, so they're about 30 years old, and they're getting at the end of their useful life. <clears throat> As Liam Neeson said in a movie, the actor Liam Neeson, he said, it's not my problem, okay? The problem is the local landowner. It's his liability, it's his financial problem. It's not the packing companies, because they've, they've they don't have that problem. So you can't rely on Hormel, you can't rely on Minnesota pork producers. They're not gonna pay to remediate these things. The liability is in the contract with the local landowner. The people that are running the hogs through those facilities are corporations. The, the farmers don't actually own the hogs. That's what a lot of people don't even realize. They don't even own these pigs. The pigs going through the facilities are owned by corporations. The remediation of the project at the end of the useful life is not the, the hog owners, the hog, the swine operator. It's the local landowner who's basically a janitor. That's all he is. His job is to get rid of the manure, maintain the building, and take care of the pigs. So he's like a, a glorified janitor is what his job is. So the state, we've got a problem as these facilities start to age. And we're gonna have to figure out a way to do it. And I think this legislation that's proposed here is a step, a good first step to start the state looking at this issue. Thank you. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to testify for or against the bill? Um, we're gonna go move to questions from members. First on my list is Representative Jacob. Uh, thank you, Chair Jordan. So, first off, set the record straight. Uh, the testifier who said that the uh, breaches that were in my district uh, Lewis and Altura and Utica, where there may have been farms that had breaches, make it 100% clear that the city of Lewiston, the city municipality sewer pond breached, the city of Altura municipal city breached, and the city of Utica municipal uh, pond breached. They all disappeared over course of 10 years. So to sit here and say that the groundwater in my area is contaminated because of the farmers when it was the people living in towns that are certainly at least partly responsible for this. You know, my philosophy is we should always do the right thing. The farmers should do the right thing, but this uh, pitting farmers against everyone else is, that's, that's just unhealthy. Um, <clears throat> so we've had this discussion in Winona County and what we came up with is that we don't need a state regulation. We already have the authority to do this in Winona County. If we want to enact a, a, a 
you know, some type of remediation, we can do that. And what we found was that, first of all, this is a primary permitted principal use of this land that these farmers are using it for. And what became a much bigger problem was decommissioning the hundreds and hundreds of acres of solar farms that we have in our area. So <laughs> when those reach their end of their livelihood, they're taking hundreds of acres of prime farmland out of production and should be remediated back into farmland. So that became really a much bigger issue than the, uh, than the feedlots themselves or the potential breaches of, uh, uh, of manure areas. So, and lastly, to really, I mean, throw stones at the hardworking farmers in, in my area who are doing great things for our community, feeding the world, calling them merely janitors, seriously? Glorified janitors? Glorified janitors? Yep. Um, this is uncalled for. Uh, yeah, a lot of concerns with it. So uh, more comments and questions, I guess. Thank you. Well, I will also remind everyone that janitors and custodians are good people who do important jobs and should always be treated with dignity and respect. But uh, Chair Hansen, do you want to respond? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, again, to the bill, to the bill, uh, it provides for an inventory. That inventory will determine how many abandoned feedlots there are. It also provides for financial assurance. We've had, Representative Jacob, we've had a great consolidation. It's not the same agriculture as when you and I grew up. We have bigger and bigger facilities. We have some very, very large facilities in dairy, very large. And when we look at the amount of manure that's being created, whether it's waste, whether it's human waste or animal waste, we treat human waste a lot differently than we treat animal waste. How so? Chair Hansen has the floor right now. <coughs> we treat human waste a lot differently than animal waste. We require the septics in, we require uh, for those facilities the wastewater treatment. All of those issues on trying to reduce that impact of human waste. With animal waste, we spread it. And there are facilities that are very large. They're injected. But I know I could go out right now and find a manure that's spread on, sto on snow, on frozen ground, on snow. Because I saw it. So we're talking about storage here. And we're asking for an inventory. And we're asking for the financial responsibility for the entity, for the large entities, over a thousand animal units, to have the ability to clean up the mess if it occurs. And things do occur. Tornadoes occur. Death occurs. Changes in responsibility occur. Changes in ownership occur. So I had a very good meeting with the pork producers today, I thought. I think I also had a meeting with the counties where they said they were supportive of the inventory because it's prudent to find out where we're at. It's a good bill, and it was uh, similar to last year. Representative Jacob. So my question on how are uh, farm manure lagoons treated different than city manure, manure lagoons? As farmers, these cities use our land the same thing. They're spreading it out on the farmland just from the city ponds, just like they are from the farm ponds. So it's the same procedure. It's the same. I mean, we're all in this together. Uh, pointing fingers at one and saying the other doesn't cause a problem is um, counterproductive. And I agree with that. Storage is a good thing. And um, then we don't need to put manure out on the frozen ground in the middle of the winter. So, yeah, we need the storage facilities. No doubt about it. Uh, uh, this uh, point and fingers and counterproductive. Thank you. Chair Hansen. Madam Chair, you know, this is the response we get whenever we try to problem solve. Whenever we try to problem solve, there's a response of people saying things that they didn't say. 
So there are differences. I could invite you down to Pig's Eye to the wastewater treatment plant where the public puts in a huge amount of money to deal with human waste. That's different than how we deal with animal waste. The bill is a prudent effort to do an inventory. And I certainly realize that manure is valuable right now. So hopefully there are fewer abandoned feedlots. But things happen. And we've just been through a significant pandemic. What if a large facility with COVID, what if it goes bankrupt? Who's going to deal with it? Who's going to deal with it? I know what will happen. People will be coming here and wanting us to pay for it. Uh, Representative Jacob. Uh, thank you, Chair Jordan. If there's an abandoned manure pit, I have personally paid many thousands of dollars to my neighbor to buy his manure to inject onto my farm because I no longer have animals. I only have crops. There's no problems with getting rid of that manure. So to say that we're going to ask the public to pay for something that I'm willing to pay for myself, and I don't take government money. So, um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a problem looking, it's a, it's a solution looking for a problem. Chair Hansen, response, and then we're going to move on to other members. It's a good bill. Representative Burkle. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <laughs> So I'm curious, is there anyone from MPC here? I'm just, I want to kind of get a handle on. Um, yep. Is, oh, Tom's here. Maybe I could ask a question. If, Why don't you ask your question while MPCA comes on down? So I'm curious um, if MPC has seen big issues with this before. Is there a, has there been a, a huge problem in the past, I don't know, decade, two decades, last year? I don't know, how many abandoned feedlots are we? Over a thousand animal units now we're talking about, correct? Going to the bill. How many have been abandoned now? I mean, do you, I know that we're talking about an inventory, but it just, I've never heard of this problem. I've never heard of a problem getting rid of manure, as Representative Jacobs just said. So I'm curious if there's a, a problem I've never heard about. Mr. Johnson, please state your name for the record um, and then fill us in. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, uh, to committee members, Representative Burkle, um, the MPCA, we uh, received notification. Please state your name for the record as well. Oh, excuse me. My name is Tom Johnson, Government Relations Director for the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Um, the MPCA received notification when uh, specifically the the number of, of um, uh, for for the when, when there is closure of the large 100 animal unit plus facilities are are closing down. I, I don't know that we've seen a, a huge issue with this, but I understand that the intent that the author has here is, is uh, as a proactive measure moving forward. So uh, that's our understanding of the intent of the bill um, and uh, as we testified to it last year, same. Representative Burkle. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I guess the question, or it sounds like the answer is right now that you don't know of any. You're, the, the intent of the bill would be to count what might be there now, correct? Director Johnson. There is none now. Director Johnson. To my knowledge, but there's an inventory in the bill. Right, right, yeah. correct. Representative Hansen, what is the intent of this bill? The intent of this bill is to look. You know, so we've heard huge number, a number, <clears throat> none. The answer is we don't know, and that's why we're funding an inventory. Representative Burkle. So I understand that. <clears throat> and 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 I don't see a problem with necessarily funding the inventory. So the question I've got then is going towards the financial assurance part of the bill. Um, it, as Representative Jacob just said, it, it looks like a solution looking for a problem. But n needless to say, I mean, beyond that, I'm, I'm curious if there are financial instruments now, and maybe this is more for Chair Hansen, but um, are there financial instruments, are, are there states doing similar things? And are there financial instruments that are available to farmers to even purchase? Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the model, <laughs> Representative Burkle, where this was uh, taken from, and uh, nonpartisan staff could maybe look at that as well, was from the Commercial Pesticide Applicator Program, 
where you have different assurances of financial responsibility. Some, are, some of those assurances could be a letter of credit uh, signed by a bank. Some could be uh, insurance policy. I realize that's harder to get. Um, but there are different instruments that are used for commercial pesticide applicators at the businesses that are involved in those, and those have been there for 30 or 40 years. So the model here is to look at that to provide options for some type of proof, and again, as we discussed yesterday, to clean up in case something happens. Representative Burkle. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I, guess, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, I, th I think as you stated, Representative Anson, farms are getting bigger. People want cheaper food. It's kind of the way of the world. And I understand what you're trying to do here, but I think what you're, intent is, is it's, it's misguided and we've all talked about um, and the land stewardship folks could, could get up and speak to but I'm not going to ask the question but consolidation in the meatpacking industry consolidation just in general bigger and bigger farms um, as if that's a problem I don't know that it's creating more manure it's just consolidating where the manure is it's probably actually better to be honest with you but I guess what I'm getting at is I, th I think what your legislation is really going to do is just force smaller farmers for a business, and I, I think I, th I don't think the intention of your bill is, is what's going to happen. I guess is what I'm getting at. Representative Burke, was that a question for Chair Hanson? It's more a comment if he wants to comment back, but I just I don't think the intent of the bill is, is going to be good for farmers in the end, and I think you're really just going to make farmers, farmers bigger. Got it. Chair Hanson. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the financial assurance requirement is over a thousand animal units. Um, I did discuss with the pork producers today I'm open to working with them again the goal here is how do you have some protection for the public pur purse if something happens and these are permitted facilities the agency permits them we provide a, from the level of government that it's okay to operate how do we make sure that if something happens that it isn't the public having to clean up the mess that's my goal I'm open to figuring out how the best way to do that is, um, and that's why this bill is being laid over for possible inclusion. Uh, Representative Burkle, last question, then we're going to move to other members. Yeah, that's fine. I'll just wrap up. But I just want to make it clear that, you know, in one sense, it seems like we talk about this uh, this manure management pr problem. Um, I mean, we just heard a bill yesterday in ag. Uh, it was actually Representative Purcell's bill on soil health, and manure management is part of that. Manure management is an important thing. And there's a lot of value in this manure, as you said. There's, in fact, you said it's valuable now. It's, it's always been valuable, and it's even more valuable now. Um, and if we're going to move away from other types of fertilizers, I would think that, I don't know, we need more animal in our, manure on our land, not less. So I'm, I guess I'm just disappointed that in the context of providing food for this nation, we've decided to, to demonize farmers. And, and maybe that's not your intent. Maybe you don't even mean that, but it just feels that way. Representative Schultz. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Hansen. Uh, to this point, a lot has been covered here uh, within the scope of our conversation. I don't know how much more there is uh, to truly add on this, uh, but simply speaking, um, it should be relatively easy for us to determine over history, over time, um, if there is an instance where um, this sort of concern that you bring forward has happened in our state at a facility that had over a thousand animal units. Do you have any evidence to this point? Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Schultz, no, I do not, but I do have evidence that during COVID, we had to euthanize a large amount of livestock and the public had to help pay for that. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Hansen. Uh, I think that that underscores um, some earlier comments made by members on this side of the aisle, uh, that, that in this situation, we appear to be in search of a problem. And uh, that's, that's what's concerning to me. I want to make Minnesota more competitive. I want agriculture to thrive like it has for 170 years in our state 
And, um, and I want us to be able to support the family farmer. In one of the counties that I represent, there used to be 300 dairy farms. And today, there are between 60 and 70. We need to be able to support the family farmer amidst consolidation like we've heard. And this type of legislation, which is similar to other bills that have been heard in meatpacking in other parts of the legislature this session, threaten the competitiveness that we have in our state. And there are so many industries in greater Minnesota that provide for the things that we need from, from food to steel. And we need to lead in Minnesota and this legislation will take away from our competitiveness and the ability for uh, farming operations to thrive. And I think that we have fantastic corporate responsibility in this state and companies and farmers and those involved in agriculture who not only want to take care of the land to pass it on to future generations, but they also are here to help in the time where government actually can't even fix the problem. And we've, there's actually more examples of corporate responsibility happening in our state to fix the problem than there are examples of the problem. So let's focus upon things that make Minnesota more competitive. Representative Purcell. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would just like to uh, give a compliment to the author for the uh, thousand limit. So I have many family farm, um, actually, actually family farmers, uh, some who will be in the Ag Committee uh, in about an hour. Um, but certainly I have a friend who's bu whose business in the karst region of our state is raising hogs. The maximum that she raises is about 100. I mean, we have to figure out a threshold where we um, can have some responsibility and, and have some corporate stewardship and, um, and see that play out. But I think we've heard a lot about PFAS and PFAS, so I guess I would um, balk a little bit at Representative uh, Schultz's comment about corporate responsibility and, um, and just say that uh, I, I think we want to make sure that this uh, targets the right folks in the right space and um, conversation around that is, is really welcome. And, um, but I wanted to compliment that, you know, the, at this point, the way that the bill is written, the, the head is at 1,000. Seems very reasonable for a beginning farmer. Um, if we're worried about the startup, the small, the beginning farmers, 1,000 is a lot. Um, and you can make you can make a living uh, as as folks I know who have on much smaller. That's my comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative <coughs> Jacob, one last question, and then I'll we're going to go to closing comments. I'll be brief. Uh, thank you, Chair Jordan. So, with respect to um, the the thousand units, what we've seen in Winona County, this is, causes fragmenting of farms. So they will. Okay, they need to have five, six, seven, eight thousand. So now they do what we call creative parceling. They parcel those farms out. They become less efficient. You've got to use, you know, more uh, storage facilities. Uh, you can't use the piping of the manure through the. And we actually put the infrastructure in for the farmers for free, or at you know, uh, into the roadways in Winona County to pump manure by hose rather than these big tankers at the testifier showed how heavy they are and damaged the road. So we figured out ways to be efficient. This eliminates that, puts it back into multiple small areas, lose the efficiencies and drives the prices up uh, for the consumer and makes it more expensive for people in Minnesota to do business. And then they go to South Dakota, Wisconsin or elsewhere. Thank you. Chair Hansen, uh, closing comments. Thank you, Madam Chair members. This is a bill that looks for an inventory to provide actual data in terms of abandoned feedlots. It also looks at trying to prevent problems uh, if they occur with financial assurance. 
using a model that's already there for commercial pesticide applicators. Is it the best one? I'm happy to work with uh, members of both sides of the aisle and from the industry to try to make that work. But getting data on abandoned feedlots is important. And I'd ask for your support. I renew my motion that House File 955 be laid over for possible inclusion. Representative Hansen renews his motion that House File 955 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill, and the bill is laid over. Um, and with that, I will pass the gavel back to Chair Hansen. <laughs> Rep Representative Liz Lagarde, would you like to move that House File 1699 be recommended to be re-referred to the Capital Investment Committee? So moved, Mr. Chair. Representative Liz Lagarde, to the bill. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and committee members. Um, 1699, which will build a much-needed spur of the Masabi Trail from my hometown of Aurora to the city of Hoyt Lakes. Members, the Masabi Trail in northeastern Minnesota is a gem if you've never been there. It stretches from the Mississippi River in Grand Rapids to the Boundary Waters near Ely with a few small gaps to be completed. Currently over 150 miles are finished. When totally complete, it will be a 165 mile continuous paved biking and walking trail linking 28 communities. Visitors to the trail will find a 10 foot wide asphalt trail built on um, old bedrock, abandoned highway grades and old logging and mining roads. We have a few testifiers here and I would welcome them to the committee. First testifier, um, the list. Sarah Chiotetto, St. Louis and Lake County's Regional Railroad Authority. Welcome. Good afternoon, Chair and members. My name is Sarah Chiquetto, and I am the Deputy Director of the St. Louis and Lake County's Regional Railroad Authority. I'm here today in support of House File 1699, and I would like to thank Representative Liz Lagarde for introducing the bill and Representative Scraba for your support. The Rail Authority owns and maintains the North Shore Scenic Railroad that runs from Duluth to Two Harbors. We have also proudly built and now maintain the Masabi Trail, a 10 foot wide paved bike trail that extends from the Mississippi River in Grand Rapids to the Boundary Waters in Ely. To date, we have completed 156 miles of the full master plan length of 165 miles. In the next construction season, we'll, we will begin to close the gaps, the two remaining gaps, and we expect the trail to be finished in 2024. To that end, we have preliminary plans for grand opening in 2025. Over the years, numerous requests have come in from communities to be attached to the Masabi Trail Corridor. Hoyt Lakes is the first of these communities. In 2015, their city council met and agreed unanimously to officially request a spur connection from Aurora to Hoyt Lakes. At that time, the rail authority was not in a position to grant such request. As we now reach completion of the trail, we can begin tying in these communities in our area. At the full plan length of 165 miles, the Masabi Trail is one of the longest, if not the longest, fully paved bike trails in the country. Most other long distance bike trails are comprised of hard packed gravel or crushed limestone. Only one compares to ours, and that is the Paul Bunyan Trail that goes from Bemidji to Brainerd. They have 115 miles. As I stated, we have 156, soon to be 165. The Masabi Trail is at least 95% ADA accessible with solid paved surfacing for all but a small, small packed gravel portion in the Darwin Myers WMA. It is also not a typical rail trail because it is not straight nor is it flat. This trail has 3,300 feet of elevation change over the whole length and there are numerous curves and bridges giving a cyclist an exciting and dynamic ride through, a rich, through an area rich in history and natural resources. 
The beauty of the Masabi Trail, aside from the stunning scenery, is the fact that it connects and unifies 28 small communities along the Masabi Iron Formation and provides the diversity needed to strengthen the area's economy. Northeastern Minnesota is full of outdoor recreational opportunities. Fishing, boating, and hunting have been popular pastimes for many years. OHV use has seen an increase, but cycling is having its moment now. And the Masabi Trail is in a prime position to entice biking enthusiasts to experience all there is to offer here. Not only is the trail a destination in and of itself, but it, is al it also provides access to other area attractions such as the new Redhead Mountain Biking Park and Giants Ridge Golf Resort. The proposed segment is a five and a half mile route that will travel through undeveloped lands owned by Blandin and Elite, two companies the Rail Authority has been extremely successful in working with in the past. The remainder of the route will be within the County Run 110 right of way entering into Hoyt Lakes. Connecting the vibrant and active community of Hoyt Lakes to the Masabi Trail Corridor will add needed amenities for the users of the trail, including lodging, restaurants, and other attractions. We have already seen these needs increase. This past year, 2022, the Rail Authority began a marketing campaign to reach national audiences. In just six months, we have seen a marked increase in interest and request for information. Over 286,000 users were logged on our trail counters in 10 months of time. And our shuttle service and our trip planning service have been overwhelmed. Today, our marketing firm is starting the next phase of the campaign, including a release of videos and social media posts. The Masabi Trail has great ability to unite communities, reconnect families as all ages and abilities can use this trail, and strengthen the economic diversity of the region. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I am happy to stand for questions. Are there any other testifiers? Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to testify for or against the bill? Representative Lisgard to close. Well, thank you so much. Uh, as you heard, no, representatives. <laughs> representatives. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Dave. Sorry, Rep. Oh, that's okay. You stole my show. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was like, I was like waiting for a question. You know, like, hey, um, I, I am co-author of this bill. Um, this, I've been associated with the Masabi Trail since Jim Overstar's idea, and this has been a, um, a labor of love for a lot of people. Um, we've always tried to figure out how we're going to hook up to the Gitchigami Trail the North Shore Trail, and this is going to be one of the, perhaps the link, if we can get to Aurora, White Lakes, and then White Lakes, Forest Highway 11. Uh, we don't know, but it's, it is a connection, and then our big connection is going to be from Grand Rapids to the Paul Bunyan, and when we get that, then, then you can bike across Minnesota. So I, I encourage passage. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And uh, on that bike uh, bike trail, you'll see uh, Representative Scraba leading the way uh, across the state. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, this is a good bill. I, uh, um, I appreciate your support. That's all I got to say. Thank you. Now, I did have Burkle, then Schultz, then Jacob, but then it looks like it's now Jacob and Schultz. Is that right? Mm -hmm. On this one? Jacob. Yeah, so <laughs> just one quick question, uh, and I hope I didn't miss it. So all the land that, you know, it mentions acquisition, is that all willing participation or is there any eminent domain? Mr. Chair and members and Commissioner, this is all willing partners in this. Excellent. Uh, Representative Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just wanted to, you know, state for the record, that was uh, Representative Scraba's former work um, for DFL Congressman, uh, <laughs> Oberstar. <laughs> That's why we like him. Representative Lizgard, closing. It's a great bill. I appreciate your support. Uh, so this one we do need to move to capital investment. So um, Representative Lizgard renews his motion that House House 1699 be recommended to be re-referred to the Capital Investment Committee. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. Motion prevails. Underway. Thank you so much. You've got one more bill? One more. We're going to get her done quick. <laughs> 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 Looks like.
Everybody's got questions. No, but, uh, Representative Liz Lagarde, would you like to move that House File 592 be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill? So moved, Mr. Chair. Representative Liz Lagarde, to your bill. Well, uh, thank you, Chair Hansen and members, um, for hearing House File uh, 592, which is an all train vehicle trail appropriation from the ATV dedicated account. Uh, for the Prospector Loop ATV Trail and the Voyager uh, Country ATV Trail, both located in Northeast Minnesota. As you guys know that um, in Northeast Minnesota, we're doing the best that we can through trails and all sorts of trails to diversify our, our, our economy, to bring people up there, um, to create an opportunity not just for um, um, tourists, but also for the people that uh, work hard there. Nice. Yeah. So. Um, as you probably already know, Minnesota collects a tax on gasoline used to operate boats, snowmobiles, ATVs, and off-road vehicles. That tax is deposited into accounts within the Department of Natural Resources, and the funds are then used uh, a variety of ways. In the case of the ATV dedicated account, the legislator has used some of those dollars collected for the trail development, and that's what we are hoping here today. ATV uh, clubs across nor northern Minnesota, including the Prospector and the Voyagers, have been working closely with St. Louis, Lake, and Kuchichin counties and the newly formed Northeastern Regional ATV Joint Powers Board to develop a world-class ATV trail system. Uh, Mr. Chair, I do have two uh, testifiers that are uh, totally integrated in this uh, development of all the trails, and if we could move to them, that would be wonderful. Ron Potter, Prospector Loop ATV Trail System and President of ATV Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. My name is Ron Potter. I am the Trail Ambassador for the Prospector Loop Alliance. We are a nonprofit group made up of representatives from Ely, Babbitt, Embarrass, Tower, and Lake County. Prospector Loop has been in the works for over nine years with a goal of connecting all four of those communities in a 250 mile trail system. That was phase one, which was, is largely complete. We're here today asking for, uh, to work on connect, what we call connect four, a set of trail extensions that will allow our, our riders to uh, connect to adjacent areas, uh, adjacent services, and other existing trail systems. Um, the first one of these is to rebuild a connection, what we call the Cloquet Line, um, up to the Echo Trail. It's a former railroad grade, and we would be uh, putting back in a crossing over the Range River. Um, the second one is what we call Bear Run, which connects the David Dill Taconite State Trail to a network of existing forest roads and two, uh, two family resorts. Um, I would also add that, that this... Uh, this request, it came to us from former rep representative and former county commissioner, Tom Rukavina, asked us to make these, these connections. Um, the final connection we're looking at is from uh, Babbitt to White Lakes, which would then allow our riders to access the Iron Range Off-Highway Vehicle Recreation Area at Gilbert. Currently, we're working on an environmental assessment worksheet for these, these projects. We're partnering with the Minnesota DNR in getting the document completed. Uh, the Connect 4 projects have been reviewed by the local DNR offices and are recommended for funding by the ATV Minnesota State Organization. Um, we've seen a major increase in number of ATVs sold in the past couple years, and people with ATVs are looking for safe, outdoor, environmental-friendly places to ride those. Um, as I mentioned, our board has been working on this for nine years. We have a growing number of membership volunteers, now over 200, which we count on to help maintain this, these trails in the years to come. Um, this is really not a local trail initiative. Um, locals know where to ride, uh, ride there now. This is more of a regional trail uh, uh, proposal. Uh, we know that the metro area has a lot of registered ATVs, so does southern Minnesota, and they have a very limited area to ride. We know most of those people tend to come up north to ride. So what we're trying to provide here is a, a mapped, signed, maintained, and sustainable trail system where they can come in and, and ride where we want them to ride and not go where we don't want them to ride. 
Um, as Representative Lizagard mentioned, we work closely with the, the Joint Powers Board, St. Louis uh, Lake and Cooch County. Um, they work with the 15 <laughs> clubs that are, are in those counties, helping us request money, get the permits, get the environmental work done, and guarantee that these funds will be spent appropriately and in a uh, uh, timely fashion. With that, I conclude my presentation and I'll stand for questions. Thank you. Bruce Besty, Voyager ATV Trail System. <coughs> Welcome and state your name for the record. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Committee. My name is Bruce Besty from Crane Lake, Minnesota. I'll keep it uh, short because Ron mentioned a lot of things that are also at our club. I want to thank you, or today I'm excited here to be here representing the Voyager Country ATV. Thank you for allowing me to testify this afternoon. First, some cool news. This week, two new bridges are being delivered to our air for installation using dedicated account dollars that were awarded in earlier years. We are constructing a new multi-use four and a half mile connection between the community of bike and our core trail system. This connection will eliminate six miles of blacktop or eight miles of gravel roads to access the trails from bike. <coughs> the trail scheduled to open on May 1st. Today we're looking to continue to build out our system with this $750,000 request from the ATV dedicated account. With that, we are gonna begin the connection process to the communities in Kuchching County, including Ray, Little Fork, Ericsburg, Rainier, and International Falls. We'll identify the final alignment and complete a phase two EAW environmental assessment worksheet for these important connections. We're gonna begin a sustainable new construction from Cavatogama Township to Ray, Minnesota, and Cooch County line. We'll be constructing three new overlook shelter destinations with picnic tables and fire rings. The overall goal connecting several tourism based communities between Cook, International Falls and the Crane Lake area with a safe, environmental, responsible and sustainable available for ATV enthusiasts, enthusiasts and other users. Our system is a family oriented, easy riding trail system with incredible scenery and an opportunity to observe uh, wildlife. The system is proving to be very beneficial to our many small local service businesses. I thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to testify for or against the bill? I do have one question before we get to uh, Representative Purcell. Mr. Hagemeyer, could you maybe just describe the account, what the accounts are and where, mon where money comes from for the ATV account? Sure, as the testifier and the author mentioned, there's a number of dedicated accounts that are vehicle orientated, the watercraft recreation account, the snowmobile account, the ATV account, the off-highway motorcycle account, and the off-road vehicle account. They all get a portion of the gas tax, basically other kind of gas tax that goes into each of these accounts. They get a varying percentage. I think ATV is around $2 million a year, but the ATV account also gets ATV registration fees going into it. And that account at the end of the current biennium, based on November forecast, has about a $6.6 .6 million budgetary balance. And it's our responsibility to appropriate that. Uh, Mr. Chair, yeah, um, under Minnesota Statutes 84.927, it is subject to appropriation by the legislature for a variety of purposes that are listed in that statute. Representative Purcell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have a question for the bill author or perhaps some of your testifiers. Um, I'm glad to hear that it sounds like the process is very planful. Um, I have concerns about um, any kind of trails through fragile or pristine ecosystems and wildlife. That's why as a Southern Minnesotan, I like to go up north, it's a different ecosystem. Um, so I would love to learn more about the environmental assessment um, process that sounds like is happening um, and if, uh, like what the timeline is and if indeed you have to wait until that's completed to um, move forward. Thank you. Representative Lizelgard, Mr. Potter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, wonderful question, Representative, and I will have uh, the expert answer that one. Mr. Potter. 
Mr. Chair, committee, uh, we do an EAW or an environmental assessment worksheet is required by the, the state. Um, so that on our, what we call our uh, Connect Four, we just completed that using an outside consultant. It's been submitted to the DNR and it determined to be adequate. So it is waiting to get published in the EQB monitor and it'll be out for a 30 day public comment period. We like anything once we can't get any permits issued until that EAW is completed. So. Representative Purcell. Representative Scrabba. Thank you. Um, I Again, I'm co-author on this one, uh, and and I appreciate everyone coming up north and representative, not just ATV, but hiking and biking, the Zach Zimbog. I mean, there's so many things, different play, things to do up north. Uh, uh, one of the questions I have for uh, Mr. Potter is uh, uh, a lot of the ATV trails that are, quote, being built follow a, how, how, what do most of them ride on? I guess that's the question I want to know, if you have an answer. Mr. Potter. Mr. Chairman, uh, committee, um, most of our system is either uh, using snowmobile trail where we can, where it's sustainable, or we're using existing logging roads. And in some cases, we, we're building new trail to make those connections where there isn't existing routes. But a lot of it is on existing timber management roads. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. I just uh, very few trails are built in raw woods anymore. It's basically somewhere that has been existing. So I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, and uh, to the folks who've testified today. Uh, uh, awesome job on the work that you do. And I just wanted to ask a quick question about how we're doing on our competitiveness with uh, Wisconsin and how this bill will help uh, put us in a better frame as it relates to our neighbors to the east. Because we want to win. Representative Lizagard or Mr. Potter? Well, Mr. Chair, I definitely want to win too. Uh, but I'll turn it over to Mr. Potter. Mr. Potter. Mr. Chairman, committee members, um, we, we are, are gaining. Um, Wisconsin has a, a lot of road miles. We try not to use a lot of road miles. That's really not what our riders are looking for. We're trying to, to you know, forest roads, um, natural surface trails. Um, we are in the process of completing, with the DNR's help, a statewide master plan, which will give us an idea of where we're at on what we have for systems and where we're, we're lacking, where we need to put more, more emphasis. But uh, uh, actual number, um, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. I, I know we've added um, over the last couple of years probably uh, about 800 miles, um, but the DNR has, has that number. Any other questions? Representative Lizagard, close. Well, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair and members um, for the consideration of uh, House File uh, 592 and uh, the support and the development of the ATV trail system in Northeast Minnesota. And like I said earlier, um, for us to diversify and uh, create opportunity uh, for people from all across the state of Minnesota, and I suppose we can dip into Wisconsin, but... Uh, um, we want to beat them. Well, we do want to beat them. And uh, it is an industry that is growing leaps and bounds. Um, you know, if, if, if you uh, go into some of these small communities, to Ely, Aurora, uh, through Giants Ridge, um, all over, you'll see 50 to 100 machines, right? And, and seriously, 50 to 100 machines. In fact, uh, Speaker Hortman and um, Rob Eklund, myself, and my wife, uh, we went on the, the ride, uh, was it last year or the year before? Two we, years ago. Two years ago. Um, and it was, an, it was an incredible, you're coming, I, that's part of my closing comments. Um, it, it was a wonderful experience, and I would encourage anyone that wants to know to ask their colleague, come or ask their colleagues, including Speaker Hortman, what, what a wonderful uh, opportunity this development of this trail system can be. So um, with that, AT, uh, the ATV Minnesota is having their 2023 Ride and Rally on the Iron Range uh, in September. And I would like to invite each and every one of you to participate and join us on that ride and experience the great North.
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Lizlegaard renews his motion that House File 592 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. The bill is laid over. Members, uh, next week, I think we have on Tuesday the DNR and a couple of bills, and then we're putting together the schedule for Wednesday. A lot of work yet to do. We are adjourned. Thank you.